and uh, I've done a lot of training on presentation skills. So it's, hypnosis is talk therapy, just like psychology is talk therapy. So it just doesn't take 25 years. It can take 25 minutes. And when I say I'm not sure, it's because uh, there was, uh, I think because the people that I did this with and practice on um, knew me as a longtime martial artist. And I don't think that if they didn't go as deep as maybe they let on, that they weren't going to tell me. They wouldn't volunteer that out of respect. Okay. So I think that could be the case. And some people don't get hypnotized. They fight. They don't. They they think about other things. It's all about getting the person to relax and go into a real deep state of relaxation. That's the, and that's the best thing that I mean. <laughs> the worst thing that can happen when you get hypnotized is that you get eight hours sleep in in forty five minutes. <laughs> and that's really the, the worst thing that can happen to you. There's no. Because you, you can't make somebody do something they wouldn't normally do. You're not going to, and this was actually tested back in the 1950s. Oh, you just wrecked it. You know, I just watched a movie on, on Comet. The, the Nigerian other, candidate? I'm not sure which one. No, it was one of the sci-fi movies where this, I think it was, um, oh God, I'm trying to, Vincent Price was hypnotizing mm. people to go out and kill people. And yeah, I, I get, yeah, I get, I guess it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It okay. doesn't happen. The U.S. government tried that. <laughs> what they found, even there were certain drugs that they could administer to make people highly suggestible. And that's the thing that the word with hypnosis is suggestible. And it makes it sound as though you're going under the spell of somebody. And that's not the case. You always have your free will never leaves you in hypnosis. But, you know, there, you know, there are things that you would do when you're, you know, somebody who's boozed up or drunk that they wouldn't normally do. That could be a pretty accurate description sometimes if it's I think one of the funniest shows I ever saw in my life was in Boston. I in my early 30s stepped into this place having no idea what it was. And it was a stage hypnotist. And I laughed my head off. It was flat out hilarious. So, you know, and I think stage hypnosis is often mixed in with a little bit of booze, which makes you more relaxed. And I think people are far more suggestible. But, uh -huh. yes, there are certainly people that will, quote, not believe they can never be hypnotized. That's a, good, it's a control thing. That's pretty much it. And as I mentioned, the... Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the film, The Manchurian Candidate. It actually had the first karate fight ever in a film with Frank Sinatra. Oh, yeah. But the, uh, there's another book called The Real Manchurian Candidate, which chronicles the studies that the American government did to see if they could create assassins. If they could, convince, if they could hypnotize someone to do something, in, they would... The experiment, like you, you, you're going to take this rifle and at, at one o'clock in the morning go in and shoot this person, and they would supply the rifle, but it would have blanks in it, and the, it would be set up so no one could really get hurt. They just wouldn't see if the person would do it or not. And in the vast majority of the cases, uh, they did not do it. Yeah, didn't but they the, do? Uh, didn't they also, on some of the cases, inject some of the people like uh, mm -hmm. with LSD and stuff like that? Drugs worked a lot better than hypnosis. Yeah. Because you, you just you can't fight the effects of drugs, that's for sure. I know when I was in the army, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, I saw something. They wanted me to rat out the people, and I wouldn't rat them out because you just don't do that when you're, you know, uh, in the army. Uh, and uh, I refused. And next thing I know, they were giving me sodium pentothal. And I don't know what I said uh, when I was under, but I'll tell you. It affected me for months afterwards. I would have that's mm -hmm. like the, the truth serum. Yeah, I would have really crazy dreams and flashbacks and all this stuff, a weird stuff. And I, I really think it was because of being injected with the, the sodium pentothal. It did something. Wow. 
And uh, I, you know, I don't know. I never want to get it again, but. Yeah, I can't imagine. What was the cessation like? Uh, you know, I, it, all I know is when they injected it into me, I, I felt like it was nothing. But then all of yeah. a sudden, uh, I, I, the time, I couldn't account for it. I don't know what questions they asked me. I don't know what I said. Uh, all I know is when uh, I, with sodium pentothal, they have to keep in injecting it in, into you because as soon as they stop, it doesn't work. Hmm. So, I mean, they constantly have to, you know, be putting it in your vein. And, uh, you know, when I got back to normal, if they did it, you know, I, I you know, I said, hey, you know, uh, did I say anything? They wouldn't tell me. But the next thing I know, a whole bunch of people <laughs> were put in the stockade. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so I must have ratted oh, out. Wow. I must have ratted everybody out. I, I, I wonder if that's still use. Oh, I w wouldn't doubt it. You know, I mean, even law enforcement back in the 70s and 80s, uh, it's quite common, you know, they, you get a, because uh, I was talking to this ex-detective, he was telling me that uh, they uh, used to do that. You know, uh, they give the person a choice of being locked up or, you know, uh, a life protector test or uh, they could take uh, sodium pentothal. Hmm. That is interesting. I haven't heard truth serum in decades. Yeah, well, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it's basically <laughs> it's basically like LSD from what the, you know they told me. Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, uh, sorry for cutting in, but the only time I've really heard of truth serum is from like video games and stuff like that. So that that's really interesting to me. So, well, hey, Kevin, I can tell you really when when they first injected it, I got really hot. And then I kind of like went into like a stupor and then I did this for the whole time they were injecting it, I guess I time stopped. I don't know what happened. It like oh. I was awake, but I'm not awake. I didn't know what was going on. Wow. That's uh, interesting. I, I wouldn't recommend it to my worst. En well, maybe I would to my worst enemy. There you <laughs> go. Find out his darkest secrets. Yeah. Well, you know what I found out afterwards? Um, they did, the, the medic did tell me it was a form of uh, like LSD. So, I mean, you know, it it breaks down, get, I, I guess it gives you a real good high or whatever. I That's all I vaguely remember that. That was back in the uh, early 70s, you know. Dang. So, hey, a question too. You know, I yeah. was reading a book years and years ago about, it, I guess it happened in England about this little kid uh, was talking about that uh, he was a fighter pilot and his uh, Spitfire, you know, um, you know, uh, was shot up and caught on fire. And he, he you know, he was t mentioned people's names, uh, what unit he was in. Have you ever heard that that uh, story? Yeah, that's just really good. That's in the re in the regressive hypnosis. Where that is used a lot is in therapy, helping people to stop smoking or if they have phobias. And for instance, people, this has not been my experience. Uh, some of the hypnotists that I've, I've worked with and trained with through the years share these stories. But for instance, somebody that it has a fear of flying and you you regress them to the first time they ever had this feeling and you have no you know you, you could be in world war ii as a completely different person going down in a plane crash over the pacific uh -huh. and that fear has been there ever since uh, uh, that's that's where I, I i pulled away from hypnosis because i didn't want to that's that's not a bad story to hear but when you get uh, a regression about some kind of fear of maybe public speaking or colors or whatever it might may be, and you regress back to the first time that happened, it's usually not a good experience. It's usually a really bad experience. Oh, wow. And I, I didn't feel like I had the skills to really help this person at, in such a crisis. And they're reliving the crisis right there crying their eyes out, bawling. I mean, it's, 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 it's uncomfortable for me. Again, as I mentioned before, you feel somewhat like a peeping Tom at times uh, because the, 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 the stories that you go back to and you have no idea where you're going. 
you know, let's really go back to the first time that you had this feeling that you're visiting me today for, and you don't even say what it is, like the first time you smoked or the first time you got drunk. You go back to the first time you have this feeling, and you just you have no idea where you're going to end up. And what you're describing about the kid is maybe, uh, that thought he had a past as a past life as a fighter pilot fits right into that. So if, you, if you've never had a, a, a really good regressive hypnosis hypnosis on your show, that would be somebody I think you'd find to be fascinating. Yeah, but he wasn't program. He wasn't even hypnotized. He was just going around and and telling you know his parents and everybody about that he used to be you know a fighter pilot. Yeah, they, and, you know, then I guess when he was a little bit older, uh, you know, then it kind of like faded away. But they did a lot of checking and the name matched the, the, the unit he was in, you know, that the guy, that name, his plane, you know, uh, was shot up and caught on fire and he burned up in the plane and all that stuff matched. And I, and I read that and, you know, it kind of like it was scary, you know, uh, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's interesting that you, you would think that. Kids at that age, at that time, had vivid imaginations about flying airplanes and things. I don't know if it's so vivid today with kids. But when the facts start to match up, it definitely raises an eyebrow. Yeah, especially, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it, it would. Now, have you, going back to, like, near-death experiences, uh, like mentioned somebody being basically on the slab in the morgue, and they uh, came to, I mean... Um, uh, oh, how bad was it for, uh, you know, I mean, how, did they, how much were they able to describe? I mean, well, the, 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 the stories are, are, I went through a lot of stories, a ton of stories in order to find ones that I thought were really compelling, believable. And the, uh, there was enough of this person in the media to, give me enough to pull from that I thought that they are there in their mind telling the truth. They, they've been interviewed by skeptics and believers and gone the whole gamut. So that's how I would qualify these guys. And so I, I came up with 10 uh, doctors and scientists and 10 suicide survivors. Um, for that reason, I'll, um, I, I lost my train of thought. Tell me again your uh, your question on that one. Uh, well, I mentioned you know like uh, you know waking up on the slab when they thought oh, right, they were right, dead. Right, yeah. and, you know the, the ex experience, especially like on a suicide. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, or attempted suicide. Over. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I, from what you were telling me earlier, I mean, it, it, I, I tell you, it, could, it sounds like it'd be really scary. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, and there's definitely some injuries. This uh, one girl was 15, and she took a gun and put it to her head, and at the last minute, a voice told her, lower the gun. And she lowered it and shot herself in the chest instead of shooting herself in the head. And that turned out to be a suicide survivor that um, she felt that God had told her to lower the gun. There's no telling. It's such a stressful moment when you get ready to take your life. Who knows? what goes through your mind. But she was, uh, she realized very quickly the mistake she had made. And the guy that was on the slab, he was hit by a car. So he had some healing, physical healing to do. Even Alexander, the neurosurgeon, his brain was attacked by an extremely rare virus. And he was in a deep coma for seven days. And the doctors, people in coma, can often hear everything that's going on. They just can't respond to it. But the doctors are talking about they, they were out of out of solutions. They had no idea what to do. They thought they were just going to basically let him pass because it was so so rare and fatal. And his eyes popped open, and he was he was back, and and he, but back, and he and he was changed, completely changed. So some of these guys definitely are. Uh, they have to go through not just grappling with what they've experienced emotionally and psychologically with a near-death experience. But some of them have some physical injuries as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I hate to say it. I mean, you know, um, how could, if, if you, maybe if you lived your life, you know, good and wholesome and stuff like that, 
but a lot of people don't. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> somehow the idea of, you know, demons and stuff like that, and, you know, and, uh, 